Good day to everybody tuning in. Thank you for joining us. I am absolutely proud to present the second installment of the Reuters Investment Roundtable. We've got two delightful guests here to join us today in Pat O'Meara, CEO of Invenium Capital Partners, and Troy Parides, CEO and founder of Parides Strategies and former SEC commissioner. Um, I think we're going to have a great hour of conversation ahead, and I will leave the floor to both of you. And thank you again for joining us today. Hey, thank you for having us, uh, Merrick. Uh, this is Pat O'Meara uh, with In Inventing Capital Partners, and it's just a uh, an absolute pleasure to be with you and to be with Troy. Uh, and uh, Troy, if I can, can I, uh, well, why don't I start with just a quick introduction. Uh, Inventium Capital Partners, which we're gonna be talking a lot about what we do over the next little bit, but my background is I worked for Raymond James and Bear Stearns. Um, and then I left and started my own investment bank, uh, which was focused on a part of the capital markets uh, that we thought were mispriced on the, on the debt side. Uh, that uh, small firm became the, uh, global dominant player in that niche. And I sold that in 2014. I became chief investment officer for a university, uh, which sounded uh, like more fun than it actually was. So I left and started Embedding Capital Partners, where we're focused on the movement to a digital economy, particularly as it relates uh, to the capital markets. And how do we have data integrity and facilitate price discovery for the private markets. And uh, Troy is uh, a friend and a member of our advisory board. And uh, Troy, if I, I can, I'd like to throw it to you and maybe you could do a, a quick introduction. Sure, I'll do a quick introduction and then get it uh, teed up here. So Troy Paredes, I have my own consulting firm, as was mentioned, Paredes Strategies, focus on compliance, financial services, corporate governance, regulation, capital markets, FinTech, and all things along those lines. Prior to that, I'd been a commissioner at the Securities and Exchange Commission in the US, as was mentioned, and Pat mentioned that he was a chief investment officer at a university. I used to be a law professor at a university uh, back in the day and had been a corporate lawyer even before that. So it's really a great uh, opportunity today to have some time to spend with Pat and chatting about what Avinium is up to in the space uh, more broadly. So I think with the intros uh, out of the way, why don't we go ahead and Pat and uh, jump right in. Sure. I, I think that one of the uh, kind of underpinning foundations to this conversation is really talking about uh, the ability to price data rich, low frequency trading assets, because when people call for marks on those assets or particularly when it's a hard time to get a mark on them. You know what I mean? Because the markets are being dislocated, et cetera. And, and could you talk for a minute about uh, you? You were commissioner of the SEC during that period, seven, eight, nine, when there was a lot of turmoil in the markets. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that. Well, it's a really interesting um, point in terms of the pricing of assets in that period. We can see some of that perhaps now and even at other periods where there aren't such significant dislocations. Think of what makes markets work while well, it's prices and not just a price, but prices are supposed to incorporate information. And the question is, is what information does a price in fact incorporate? What perspectives, diversity of perspectives does it in fact incorporate? That then when you aggregate all that up and markets do what they do, buying, selling, liquidity, and all the rest, you get what is the, I guess, best assessment as to what the value of that asset happens to be. Stocks, bonds, widgets, real estate, uh, what have you. And if you think about a period like 2008, 2009, one of the big concerns and questions, there were lots of big concerns and questions uh, that I was living through when I was in, at, the, at the SEC then. But in addition to other big questions and concerns was the question of, well, what's a particular asset worth? And if you don't know or have adequate confidence in terms of what an asset is worth and the information that it is reflecting, the tendency can be to say, whoa, time out, I'm just out. But if I don't have a way of wrapping my arms around, now I may have a different view as to what others have. And frankly, that difference of view is what makes markets markets, buyers and sellers. But if I'm not sure what the heck's going on, a rational response is just to, to back away. Well, the problem, of course, is, is that people back away in mass. Well, then you don't have the liquidity. You don't have the, the, the buy uh, side of things. And then you see the bottom start to fall out of asset prices until people kind of get um, things get stabilized and that confidence uh, is, uh, is re-energized, if you will, 
uh, based on people having a good insight into what, uh, what information is available and the, uh, and the prices. And so all of that is to say that during a period like we had in 08, 09, in addition to whatever one's theory is and view is as to what caused the crisis as such, the challenge when it comes to understanding asset prices obviously is an added difficulty. And, you know, we've seen a lot of volatility recently, a lot of uncertainty recently. And then you just say, even in, let's call it, you know, normal periods where there isn't a particular stress, this question of what's an asset worth is ever present to some degree or another if you have Ill illiquid markets. And so then a challenge here is, is, well, how do you take something that's illiquid and introduce some measure of liquidity, which then has some compounding beneficial effects? So if you, if you take that, Pat, and, and you can certainly poke holes in that if you like, but if you take that perspective as kind of an overarching framing about markets and pricing and values and, and trading and liquidity and the benefits that can flow from that, uh, where, does, where does Invinium and what Invinium is doing slot in. And, and I think it's always useful, at least from my perspective, to kind of bring things to life with some concrete examples. So if there are some examples that perhaps you could share with folks, even if they're very stylized and at some sense made up, but illustrative, uh, I think that'd be useful to, to get the conversation uh, moving along further. Absolutely. And so when we think about this move for, uh, to a digital economy, right, where, where uh, capital markets transactions and digital commerce um, and capital markets transactions as well as retail commerce um, are more and more digital. Uh, there is a reliance on data. You need to understand who your counterparty is. You need to understand what the transaction is, the legal framework, all of those um, are there, but, but also the underlying asset performance data is very important. And in the public markets, you have Emma for MSRB, you have the Edgar database for uh, the public companies. And in these periods when people are saying, what's the true value, uh, quarterly filings really seem like a long time in between, right? Or even monthly updates. And what, what's the performance of the asset so that you can trade them? Well, then that, as you said, gets compounded even further when you're talking about illiquid assets or private markets, right? Where you don't have a database that you can go to where a failure to file uh, or a, uh, an incomplete filing or a, uh, a, a material misrepresentation of filing has consequences that are uh, criminal, right? Uh, in, in, uh, in, in, the, in that final one. Well, in the, in the private markets, when you're looking at uh, data uh, or performance of assets, uh, key to that is data of the underlying asset and how does it perform. So what Invenium can do right now is provide data integrity. And so to, just to give an example, we'll take an office building in downtown New York right now. We can take all of the data coming in from their building information management systems, their computerized maintenance management systems, all the various different acronym systems that they have that collect data for financial, operational, experiential, and legal, you know, at least abstracts, et cetera. We gather that data. And what we do is we validate the data. Um, we verify the data. And, and, it's, uh, and what that does is it, we take it in, we notarize it for completeness, we index it so it's searchable, we field it, we validate it or we get other people to come in and validate it. And then that good data that is reliable, we can literally use that to power other tools like a price discovery tool. So with a partner, Cushman and Wakefield, who we're using right now as, as a, uh, somebody who's helping us, literally we can provide a monthly price or value, fair market value on that commercial office building. That's what's called US PAP compliant and quarterly FERIA compliant meaning a bank can lend off that price. So what we're doing is we're, we're gathering data and we're becoming, if you will, kind of this stylized example, a Carfax uh, for an office building, right? In the US, uh, Carfax is uh, a, a mechanism to understand uh, the performance and care of a car. So that's, that's, I would say, a stylized example, but let me give one more, right? You wouldn't ever buy an, a company that didn't have audited financials because you want to understand their, uh, their uh, performance financially. But if they ever stop getting those audits, what do you have to do? You have to re-audit the balance sheet, and then literally you begin uh, getting third parties to audit financial performance 
so that when they report to you, you have an audit of a third party who's done sampling audits to look at that data. When you buy a commercial office building or a, or a private asset, private equity, a, a business, um, you go in and you do an audit, right? What do you do with a building? You go in and you audit the, with your structural engineers, the building, and you look at hazardous materials, uh, 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 reports, whether it's asbestos or mold or whatever it is. And you get, you look at their, their systems, whether it's electrical or HVAC, mechanical, everything there, you get a, a good sense of the building and then you buy it. But then your own data systems take over in the management of the building, but there is no audit on a short interval where a third person looking at your data can say, yes, here are mechanisms for me to trust your system's data. And that's what Invenium does. We come in and we credential the data, you know, notarize it for completeness, right? We index it so it's searchable. We field it so that it can be compared against other assets. And then we get, we bring validators in to validate the data. And then we can use tools. The first tool is a pricing tool for that asset, but then all other risk management tools, et cetera. But what we're doing is for a, these private assets to trade, we're providing the foundation, which is data integrity. The, the, Troy, does that make sense? Yeah, and to, to try to operationalize this or get into the operationalization of what you just said a little bit more, walk folks through, if you would, the role of technology in what you're doing, right? Because you could imagine, just given that description, somebody saying, look, you know, we've had notaries for a long time, people have been collecting data, there's been spreadsheets, there's been, you know, ways of doing more manual reconciliations, et cetera. That's, that's been going on for a long time. Yeah. Um, but one thing that's changed is just the sheer amount of data, the availability of data and different kinds of data that gives you insight into an asset, the whole field of alternative data, et cetera, et cetera. That's now available out there for all sorts of things. In addition, the ability to crunch that data, but of course there's other kinds of technology, blockchain, what have you. So to what extent does Invenium leverage some of the more you know, cutting edge current developments in technology to allow Invenium to do this differently or do it at scale and scope differently than you were able to do or one would be able to do if they were using more manual processes? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, uh, Troy. The, you know, there's what we're doing literally wasn't possible four years ago uh, it, with the, because of the technology developments. But what we do is we use basic what's called RPA or robotic process automation, where we can gather from an individual or a machine on a repeated basis data that's already in clients' data systems. We bring that in. And then we do that notarization, indexing, fielding, validation of that data from their data systems. And we do that on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, but on a programmatic basis where we pull that data in as well as gather from individuals. And we gather that data in and we do basic functionality, you know, of exception reporting, et cetera. And there's lots of different tools to do this. But what we're doing is this is a mechanism for you to credential your data so that third parties can believe it. Right. So that literally that people can look at this data and say, yes, from the, at the time it was originated, here's who the author was. It was contemporaneously created. It was uh, it was fielded correctly. And we, we've had mechanisms of validation on that. So this is data that I can go through and, and, and trust. And so what we're doing is we're credentialing the data as it's being created. And so kind of a deal room, right, whenever you're selling a $200 million real estate office, you create a war room or deal room in order to put everything in there uh, for somebody to look at it. What we're doing is we're maintaining that every day, every week, every month, every quarter. So it's always ready for sale. And as we do that, we, we hash it so that there's an immutability to it. And we can hash that where we stick it in the payload of a block, you know, on the blockchain. So literally that data is immutable uh, and that can be, uh, you know, a public chain. It can be a private chain. Or if you don't want to be on chain, we could do it to what's called a local Merkle tree inside your database, where literally you're creating a mechanism, a cryptographic hash to show this document has not been changed at all based on that timestamp. In addition, what this does is it prepares large corporations, their data systems ready to move to the blockchain, right? And this is not the data in their systems going on to the blockchain, but interacting with it where literally the blockchain is used as a mechanism to commute trust on the, perform on the data. Is it, has it been changed? Who put it on there? 
when was it put on, et cetera, so that literally we can trust the data and we can trust the prices that are created off of that. Um, and to, to give up, uh, Troy, one last kind of comment, sorry, to, uh, the, on this, to use just a silly example, right? When we, uh, it, when there's a salmonella outbreak in the US with romaine lettuce, right? That's some farms in California. When you go into the grocery store in uh, New York and you're gonna buy some romaine lettuce for your family, uh, it, it, and it, it says it's from a, a farm in Georgia. They give you just enough data for you to believe it, and it's binary. Do you believe it? It's from a farm in Georgia, yes or no? And if you do, you buy it. If you don't, you just say, ah, the risk is too great, right? And so what's the basic amount of data that they need to show you? Here's where it was grown, here's who trucked it here, we received it at this date, and you go, I believe that. Now let's go to that same thing when you're talking about a real estate transaction, a private equity transaction, or a mark to market on an infrequently traded bond, or a 15C212 filing of an MSRB or muni bond um, in EMMA, is there enough data that you trust it? And it, when you push on it, there's a provenance all the way back to the original documentation. And that's what we're providing, that data integrity for private market assets to facilitate digital trade. And so you've mentioned several times, and uh, no surprise, uh, the word data. And you know, I made reference to alternative data just by way of trying to get a sense of the scope of the information that's available out there now and that people use that simply wasn't available um, you know, recently. And every day, probably as we've been speaking, there's more and more data, there for sure is more and more data that somebody's crunching to make some judgment more precisely and accurately than would otherwise be the case. So that is kind of an overall philosophical cornerstone on a lot of stuff, including I think what we're talking about today. So just to, I think, um, help flesh out when, when Pat, you, you referenced data, you could imagine the most obvious data when you're talking about real estate is, is, you know, title deed, right. And the County recorder's office or wherever it happens to be, you know, recorded, uh, similarly, but it's about much more than that when you're trying to understand a building from a value perspective and otherwise. So in terms of the kind of data that you have in mind, when you say data, uh, for these purposes, oh, what, what kinds of things beyond title ownership um, are you uh, are you contemplating and are you in effect referring to when you refer to data in this context? Gotcha. And, and, and so not when we talk about this, it really is an unlimited amount of data that we contemplate. But what we're actually doing today and we began pricing these types of assets uh, earlier this year, um, literally, we're talking about um, everything from key fob data to maintenance of mechanical systems to footfall traffic to lease abstracts to uh, you know pulling data directly from Yardi uh, where we're talking about rent payments. And this type of data is incredibly important because of the confirmatory nature of it, particularly as human behavior changes in relationship to those assets like commercial real estate, right? Because there's a new normal. The old models don't work anymore, right? There's a new normal and large real estate holders are needing mechanisms to communicate my portfolios performing better than the rest of the market or best than better than people's worst fears. You know what I mean about this? And I actually have people coming into the office. Yes, they're paying rent. I can show this to you real time. And so rather than waiting for monthly or quarterly or in semi-annual reports, literally we have, what we're doing is creating the piping to deliver data that as the data comes in and we call it notarization, it's actually digital certification that the data is complete, right? We say here it comes in, it's digital certification that it's complete. We index it so it's searchable. Again, we field it correctly. And then we create a, a mechanism for validation and then we deliver it up. And then what happens is we're credentialing that data so people can behave to that physical asset in a more digital fashion, less physical inspection, right? Um, uh, you know, when there is a uh, somebody who is going to execute a trade on a building, and we've seen this in the last three months, we've had entire real estate transactions done where people don't ever visit the site. They've done them, uh, you know, at, at a distance where the banker never visited the site, where the lawyer never visited the site, but they needed to have access to see the performance of that, where they could see direct performance data to validate uh, confirmatory data that people are still going in, rent payments are being made, et cetera. Does that make sense? Yeah. And is there a, is there a limit 
um, a technological limit to the kind of data that could be captured? Or is it really a matter of, you know, within, I guess, some bounds of reason, really a matter of whatever folks decide, you offer the technological infrastructure for it to be captured, validated, credentialized, but it's not as if there's only these five or six types of data that you have the capacity to do that with respect to. So literally it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. So right now for us, there's just over 250 uh, pieces of data we collect on a building that we, that we can collect. Uh, and we're particularly focused on smart buildings, newer buildings, kind of more trophy assets, right? Um, and we think, by the way, this is an aside, um, that in the future, as institutional owners want and demand better and better data from their portfolios, right? And that they value those assets more frequently, they get better accounting treatment for that, and they communicate it, especially as fiduciaries, they're only going to buy assets that are smart assets. So we think value added real estate in the future is going to be not just putting in granite countertops, putting up some paint and some new cabinets. Value add is buying dumb buildings, putting systems in, collecting data in order to validate that data. So point number one. Point number two is there is no limit to this data as long as the owner gathers that data. And the main reason is we are not, uh, um, we are not going to replace uh, or we're not going to become a database that holds all the data about all the buildings. What we're doing is we believe, believe there's going to be a move where, to a distributed data economy where building owners and property managers that own assets, right, that um, as they collect data, we're credentialing the data in their systems and we give them the ability to share that data. So instead of their data being shared against their will or sitting in a database co-star that they don't necessarily wanna be others to be able to see how much free rent they gave or what the, they gave away intended improvements, uh, and that's in CoStar against their will, this is a mechanism to credential all the data in their own system. Just like an audit, right? A financial audit, you're not sharing your financials with anybody, you're getting somebody to audit it, but we're auditing the performance of your buildings so that when people do come in and look at it, it reduces the time dramatically to, um, for due diligence, right? And, 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 and on an asset. Number two, it allows you to do searches on the types of assets and survey a much broader area to find the best investment to, uh, to capitalize an investment thesis that you have, right, that you want to make. Uh, and, but not only that, uh, to set a price where every input on that price is fully observable, Right, And if we can make all of those inputs that drive a complex model and there's good comparables and all of those inputs are fully observable, we literally can move assets on people's balance sheets from what's called level three to a level two asset, right? Because we're making the inputs fully observable and we're moving assets from illiquid assets to marketable alternatives. And as we do that, that, change, that has huge impact. Number one, it changes um, how banks calculate their tier two capital, their capital at risk, their value at risk, how they hold it on their banking book versus their trading book, um, how they carry assets instead of at book minus accumulated depreciation, but then they can use a capital markets transaction or a tracking stock or some other uh, mechanism, a derivative to unlock that value of fully depreciated assets for large entities. But also pension plans can now carry assets at fair market value instead of at that depressed value relieving pressure on OPEBs. So what it is, is we're using technology to unlock value that may be hidden because of accounting practices or the inputs. You're not able to put a provenance or chain of custody to the data used to set the price. As we can put that provenance for all the inputs to set a fair market value on an asset, we can unlock value on balance sheets. And so let's just stick with the unlock value point. We'll kick. So you mentioned it in terms of an investor pension plan, what have you, that may hold these assets. You mentioned it in terms of a bank that may have financed um, these assets. It's also somebody who just happens to be the owner, right? another key player. The developer, which may be different from the owner, another key player. And you know, I'm sure we could go down the list, but if you stick with, with those, those providing the financing, the developer, the owner, and an, and an, an investor, in very practical terms, as you said, kind of unlock the balance sheet. You could think about it in terms of overall balance sheet management. You could think about it in terms of to what extent do you need to reserve capital, right, against a riskier asset, which then could tie that capital up and doesn't allow you to then use it for other things 
So that means capital is sitting on balance sheets that potentially could be unleashed into the economy to do what capital does when it's unleashed into the economy. Yes. To make all of that a bit more concrete in terms of real practical terms for you know, each of those types of market participants or a couple of them, what does it mean to me as a building owner if there's better pricing? What does it mean to me as an investor beyond talking about it in terms of capital sheet, a uh, balance sheet management, what does that translate into? Why in very practical terms would I, as one of those market participants, want something like this where you can get, um, uh, as you suggest, uh, more accurate pricing? Sure, and let's talk about this from three different types of building owners, right? So building owner who is a REIT, right? A building owner who's a GP on behalf of multiple LPs, and a family office because those guys really do behave differently towards those, right? Let's take a family office, right? We say many times, uh, if you have a family office in New York and they own seven buildings, uh, that person who runs that family office and owns those buildings uh, and, and many times generated that wealth that those buildings represent, he knows those buildings better than his kids, right? Then you have somebody who's a large sovereign wealth fund manager uh, if you think about those buildings as kids, he, he doesn't even know how many kids he has. Do you know what I mean? The, he's just, he's looking at this uh, in aggregate data. For the building owner, that guy ha has enormous granular data on the performance of his buildings. And this is a mechanism for him to communicate the value that's there, right, to his banker. To, and, and if he can all of a sudden start taking all of those inputs, making them observable, either putting them on chain or in a local Merkle tree where it's impossible for him to spoof the data, right? Uh, uh, in, you know, we're time stamping the data, putting a, a cryptographic hash there and it's on this database and he can communicate that. And it becomes, and his, he begins to carry that asset and he has good comps for the type of building that he has. Let's use multifamily housing. There's good comps for that asset for other trades that are happening in the marketplace. And he could say, got it. I'm all of my inputs are observable. I'm carrying this now as a level two asset and my auditor. And right now we're working with Deloitte quite a bit and they, they are willing to approve that that's a level two asset. But you know, if the management team makes that mark, suddenly we all of a sudden they say, got it. I have this. Their bank who's lending now against a level two asset they, how they interact with their own regulators about how much capital they have to reserve is less. If they're borrowing from an insurance company directly, or there's an insurance company with a whole loan against it, literally the reserves for the insurance company are lower because it's a level two asset. So that ought to, you know, you know uh, transition into lower pricing. But in fact, even if it doesn't transition to better pricing, in a market like we're in right now, their ability to give real-time live data to their banker gives that banker comfort that they're going to say, gotcha, I'm going to hold this loan as, you know, as a loan that I'm going to hold to maturity because it is a performing asset, and I feel good because that performance of the, that asset. Now let's go to an, a GP who's got LPs, Right and they own one building or multiple buildings. This is a mechanism for them to communicate the value of what they're managing to third parties, not only with their own model about fair market value of this asset, but monthly pricing from somebody like a Cushman and Wakefield who can deliver that price. So it's the ability to communicate the value that I'm delivering as a GP to my LPs that I'm giving you live time data that as it's being created, you can search the data, you can see it, and it's just piping, connecting it up. All it is is trust, right? What does the Edgar database do? Nobody goes into the Edgar database and searches it unless you're an analyst, but then data gets pulled out of there by analysts published about public companies and they say look our source data is from the edgar database we're creating a distributed edgar database a more trusted version of the data is it going to be completely trusted no but what we're doing is we're building incremental trust on it and then lastly the, that big owner that reit where they're able to say, I now have all of my assets pricing monthly, where in addition to my own mark and my own pricing models, I've got a third party giving this data to me. And all of the data, uh, you know, I've got a provenance word 100%. My ability to disposition non-performing assets or assets in markets I don't like gets much higher because I can sell this 
to a broader universe of buyers as a level two asset versus an illiquid asset. So we create quite a bit of opportunity across the different types of owners. Troy, was that too in-depth of an answer on that? Was it too <laughs> I don't think it was too uh, in-depth. The details, the details matter on everything. Um, yes. and, and this is, and this is no, this is no exception. So speaking about the details mattering, we've talked a little bit uh, more and had you expand upon the kind of data or the potential, you know, a scope of the kind of data uh, you've mentioned in several instances, you use the phrase notarize, and I know you're using that not maybe in the traditional notarization sense, but in somewhat more of a, of a broader sense of validation, digital certification, certification. Yep. So what can you share about the validation? And I'll use that as a, as a broad term to cover all of that the kind of validation that is undertaken, because you, 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 you mentioned in, in your last point, uh, trust. And yep. it's so interesting. In, in, in so many of my discussions um, with folks, um, particularly where there's a, a financial component to it, but not only when there's a financial component to it, I have a chance to talk to a lot of early stage companies on, on my podcast. Um, and in just about every discussion we have on the podcast, at some point or another, the word trust comes up. And if it doesn't come up explicitly, the notion of trust and what it is and the importance of it is, is there. And trust is key for life, for society. Trust is really key as well for markets. Yep. And when I think about what you've been saying, you could think about a situation where, whether it's a building or it's a widget or it's a whatever, I'll just go with widget to make it as general as possible. You own your widget. You know a ton of stuff about your widget. You think your widget's worth a hundred bucks. I'm interested in your widget. I don't know your widget. I certainly don't, your, don't know the widget like you. And I don't ha really have any way to figure out the key characteristics of the widget. So I'm going to place it at 50 bucks. Well, really hard for us to do a transaction when the reality is, is if I knew everything about the widget that you knew, I actually may place it at 125 because it turns out it's more valuable in my hands than it is in your hands. We could do a deal but I give it 50, you give it 100. That's because of informational asymmetries that we otherwise can't solve. So part of it is an informational asymmetry challenge. Part of it is trust and all that that means challenge. So that comes back to the question in terms of validation. Validation is a key part of that as they understand the setup. So what are the validation technique techniques? Because as you said, that seems to be a part of people getting comfortable that the validation is actually worth it and there's more oomph to it that then gives them the kind of confidence that allows them to then, you know, proceed and, you know, the deals will be whatever they'll be and the valuations will be whatever they'll be. Yeah, this is fantastic, right? The, 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 this, uh, this asymmetry between the bid and the ask, right? Because of a lack of understanding of the value of that asset. And typically the way that that's been solved is lengthy due diligence of the widget, right? And you form your own opinion or you use an oracle, a third party oracle to value that, that widget, right? And so that might be S&P or it might be Moody's or it might be some other pricing valuation metric, right? Or, or service to price the widget and you say, okay, got it. That world we think is gonna change in a decentralized world as more and more data is created, right? And what we're doing is we're facilitating not, uh, you know, it, in the past technology has facilitated one big winner, Amazon, Google, right? That is the big winner that everybody references. In, in a distributed reality, in a distributed marketplace, what we're doing is our software facilitates not one big winner database, but rather millions of data creators and hundreds of data validators that validate a unique piece of data, right? And that data validator might be a Cushman and Wakefield who manages 6,000 office buildings who can say, uh, I'm a data validator, pay me to validate this piece of performance of your data. Meaning uh, for like buildings of like age and like type, you are within a two sigma uh, of, of performance that your number is within two sigma. So we're not saying the data is correct. We're saying it's in range, right? The gotcha, that makes sense. So when we gather the data, that digital certification is not saying it's true. It's saying it's complete. Right. Right. You know, when you go into a notary, they're not saying what you're signing is true. They're saying you signed it. So the digital certification, when we bring it in, says the data is complete. The index makes it searchable. The fielding makes it uh, sure that we can compare it against the right thing and it's legible. And then we validate it and validate can be in range or validate can be. We pulled this number from 
from Yardi and it's a financial statement, but if we want to validate it, we can have Deloitte or some other accounting firm come in and say, yep, this is true, or we can attach a, an audit to it, or we can actually attach the actual bank statements to that piece of data so that if somebody wants to validate it themselves, the core documentation is there, not just the number pulled out of Yardi. Does that make sense? And so literally we can put, and, and we have 10 different sources. We, take, uh, we can take direct feeds from the Fed and they have over 550,000 data sets that we can pull for every MSA in America, where we can say, look, this is the Fed data that corresponds with what they're saying. Or we can say we're using AI, basic AI, in range, out of range. We can use machine learning. We can use paid validation, right? But what we think is there's going to be millions of data creators, every real estate company in the world that owns buildings, they're creating their own data. And they're going to pay people to validate their data, just like you pay for an audit of your financials. You pay Deloitte, you pay e &Y, you pay whoever to give you a financial audit so that people say, send me your audited financials. What people are going to do is they're going to say they're using Invenium's system to get it to a point where it's easy to get that piece of data that needs to be relied upon by a third party validated. So what we do is we create a mechanism for validators to validate that data so that when you do need to show it to third parties for whatever reason to, that needs to be relied on, your investor, your lender, your insurance company for property and casualty insurance, your tenants, whatever, whoever it is who needs to rely on the data that you want to show it's trustworthy, you have means to validate it. And so, it, it, that, but this, this, what this does is, right now there is for illiquid assets where there isn't trusted data, there's a massive illiquidity premium for the shares of, what's the equity cost of shares in a REIT versus equity, you know, the hurdle rate in order to uh, get a family office interested in investing in a single building, right? The, the, that, that illiquidity premium is massive. With better data, we're gonna compress that illiquidity premium because that data, you're gonna, you're gonna be able to use that to socialize in, uh, to in interested parties to find the right buyers, to get bids. Does that make sense? So and so is the reason for you all right now to focus on real estate, because what you're describing could be other, other, other types of assets. Um, the focus is on real estate. Is that because from your vantage point, real estate is a unique combination of one, big illiquid assets, and number two, in this day and age, there actually is a lot of data available as to the building, uh, beyond rent, beyond title, but as you said, coming, going, use, occupancy, mechanical, is the AC running, is the AC not running? What does that tell us about occupancy or people there on the weekend, yep. right? There's all kinds of stuff that is increasingly available with, as you said before, smart buildings where all of that stuff's being collected for a whole host of reasons, environmental and otherwise, uh, efficiency and the like, but that gives you data. So it's that combination in terms of the focus on real estate. One, you got illiquid assets um, where pricing can be uh, a challenge. And two, you actually have data, so you have the opportunity to bridge that gap and, as you said, address the illiquidity issues. Is that the reason to focus on real estate? Yes. And so we say kind of the, the early opportunities for us are real estate, data-rich, low-frequency trading assets, right? So data, real estate, muni bonds, right? And so we're not talking about the Port Authority of New York's, you know, billion-dollar issuance. We're talking about you know, Whitefish Montana's sewer bond that won't trade for 30 years, but during a downturn in a market or market dislocation like we've had in the last two quarters um, that we've seen in, you know, beginning Q1 and, and, and Q2, where people are questioning marks, are people still flushing their toilet in Whitefish Montana, right? What is, what is the, the, is this, is the municipality still able to pay their bonds? And what we're doing is we're getting data that can, for data rich assets that don't price often, we provide integrity to the data stream so that it can be used on a pricing mechanism so that people can have integrity in uh, communicating the value of their portfolio or a value of a specific asset or finding a new buyer if they need to. Does that make sense? Yeah, and, and we're gonna, I think in a few minutes here, open it up for some Q and A, but just a couple of things before uh, we do that. Um, just kind of want to make sure we don't miss this topic. We can come back and fill in more details. But the last few months, of course, in the country um, have been a trying period for a whole host of reasons um, here in the U.S. 
Uh, part of that is because of COVID and of course what that means in terms of people going into buildings, not going into buildings, uncertainty as to what the future is going to hold when it comes to how people work, how people live, where they live, et cetera. How is what Vinium is doing, working on, thinking about doing affected by that um, will help folks who want to better understand the real estate space do so with things shifting? I would imagine part of it is, you know, to the extent one extrapolated from historical, it's much more difficult now to extrapolate from historical because the history is probably very different than what the future is going to be. So real-time data, more current data probably becomes even that much more useful because the value of historical in terms of projecting forward is much more uncertain. Uh, but I'm sure that the ways in which COVID and how that's changing things from a real estate perspective uh, might play out as even more uh, nuanced than that uh, more obvious point that I just made. That That's a, exactly right. And so getting that real-time data stream in, right? So we're, we're collecting that real-time data stream and delivering it out to people so that they can use it because human behavior is changing in relationship to that asset, right? That means the old valuation model doesn't work. So more frequent valuation with real-time data does work. And if I am looking at your building and I'm getting a real-time feed from your Yardi system, I trust that pretty much. But if I can add and it, you know, it's been notarized on when I, it was collected and indexed and, and fielded, that makes it more valuable to me. But then we add this validation function where there's a third party or another mechanism to validate that, that builds the trust on how I interact with you um, in, in order to execute trades at speed. That's a movement from a, a, a paper to a digital economy, right? We're, we're building trust on the data. We're validating the data. Now, does that mean that all the data is true? No, but we're making it better. And over time, as we push more and more data through this, we'll be able to get better and better. But what we want to do is collect data, do all those things, right? Digitally certify, index uh, so that searchable field, validate and push it in to provide pricing. And as we can do this on a monthly basis, suddenly the large holders of real estate, they're not gonna to wanna to look at this every year or two years or every six months because they're gonna to wanna to be on their toes and nimble as they begin to create a thesis on how human behavior is gonna to work towards these assets two years from now, right? And once they do, they're gonna to wanna to incarnate that investment thesis and, and build their portfolio to it as they have conviction. And how do they build conviction behind that investment thesis? Real-time data that they can trust, right? I mean, yesterday I was listening to uh, Goldman Sachs uh, 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 interview with Tim Gray, the president and CEO of Blackstone. And his, his core statement was the way we produce the returns we have is a, a conviction behind a single investment thesis. In a changing market, better data allows you to create a thesis get conviction behind it so you can move on it to create the returns that your investors expect. And so um, if you think about Invinium, uh, you know, oftentimes people will put a company and say you're this company or that company or whatever company. And that can be unfair because you can be a lot of different things. Um, yep. But just building off everything you've, you've said, one could think about Invinium as a, as a real estate company of sorts as a blockchain you know, technology company, as a data company, as a, a validation company. Um, I'm sure there are other things. Um, as you think about uh, Invinium as the CEO and the founder and all that you're doing and the different ways to conceptualize it, um, is there one that really stands out prominently in your mind? That is, okay, here's really what we do at core, or is it really a blend of the things I mentioned as, as well as some other stuff? Yeah, thank you. And, and again, this gets to the concept that, you know, we've seen in the last 20 years, new technology creates one winner, right? That one winner and it's winner take all. Invenium is facilitating as these capital markets uh, transition and new technology comes in. There are people who are trying to build a winner takes all where they're saying, I'm going to be the custodian. I'm going to be the electronic marketplace. I'm going to be the database, all of those. What we're doing is we are a FinTech company that's providing plumbing for the 409A valuators, for the valuation experts for 820, you know, um, ASE 820, 
for the custodian, for the fund administrators, and for the electronic marketplaces to use our plumbing so that they can rely and credential data so that they can move assets more efficiently between them, right? We're the plumbing that the, all of these players in a new distributed ecosystem where financial professionals can credential their opinions and they can credential their performance in such a way that people can trust that with a lessening of due diligence and they can communicate that in this trustless environment, right? How do I do that? I create trust through short interval audits of the data, validation of the data and communicate it. So we're the plumbing in the capital market system as it relates to low frequency trading, data rich private assets. Now it may be like a muni bond, right? The 70% of the muni bonds that, that are 20% of the face value of all the muni bonds out there, right? There's 720,000 muni bonds. 70% of them will only trade two and to three times in their 30 year life, 20 year life. Those need good marks. We can provide that. Not only that, but continuing disclosure obligations that are there, right? We can facilitate those so people can trust this thing is performing the way it's supposed to. The same way on real estate, but, and, and you get that concept, right? But it's a FinTech data integrity uh, role that we play that powers tools like price discovery, that, that facilitate price discovery, right? So, and then there's gonna be credit risk functionality, risk management and mitigation functionality, um, index creation, all of those are down the road, but it's all based on data integrity on data rich, low frequency trading assets. When I said with, with the data that has integrity, there's then a lot of other functionality that can be built on top that may be different from uh, price discovery, your know, risk management, et cetera, et cetera, all sorts of analytics that you know, one could probably leverage, uh, leverage that information for. I think we're at the point, if, uh, if I'm right, that we were gonna take a pause and see if there are any questions. So why don't I go ahead and do that and turn it back to the folks to offer up the questions that may have come in. Hey, the, um, I'm going to answer the live, the first question. I've got that open. Um, uh, so uh, it's, uh, Pat, you have, uh, have you integrated ESG factors in the valuation of real estate using Inventium's ta technology? So one of the things that we're doing, right, we, De Deloitte's been helping us a lot on the accounting side here in the U.S. and they're a partner. Uh, we have a, a, a firm, an accounting firm in the U.K. that's helping us. As you know, that gap in the U.S. is, is uh, rules-based in the Commonwealth countries, U.K. It's a principles-based uh, uh, accounting uh, gap. And, and you, we have to understand those nuances but in the UK they want to know uh, have the buildings that everybody has to have a plan on how they're going to be carbon neutral right and how they're going to reduce their carbon footprint that is a something that came through in the UK that everybody has to comply with and they've got several years to do this our software is literally a mechanism by which people can implement the compliance with that, right? What is my leads compliance, et cetera. So yes, these ESG factors um, for a building, is it, is it able to meet? And there's a GRES, but GRESB that has their own set of criteria that we can uh, show compliance with the reporting and exception reporting, hey, this wasn't done. So uh, the answer to that is, is absolutely. Uh, Troy, do you have anything that you, wanna, that you would wanna add that? Well, there certainly is a lot of interest in ESG. I think the interest in ESG has just continued to pick up and will likely to continue to, to pick up. And I think uh, to, your, to your point, um, if I'm hearing your point correctly, that if somebody were to say, hey, there are these you know, X number of data characteristics that are important to demonstrating what we're doing when it comes to these elements of ESG, and we want to have a mechanism to validate that the information is accurate, then they could leverage the capabilities and functionality that an Invenium would offer. So the, the goal here may be not in the first instance about say pricing or price discovery, it may be about these other objectives. Now that may flow back in terms of people's interest Impacting on price. price. So yep. it could be a second order effect though not the intended effect or the purpose. Um, I think that's because I think there's just going to be, as we said, there's going to be more and more interest in that and the effort for folks to say, hey, here's what I'm doing. It's not just what I said I'm doing. Here's what I'm doing. And here's the steps I've taken to have that information validated. So that going back to the magic word in some in some sense, it's trusted. 
in, in that first piece, which is the ingestion piece of data, right? Because, you know, what is the technology of Invenium that we've built? It, the first part is this RPA or robotic process automation, which is the ability to collect data on a one-time or repeated basis from a machine or a human where we collect that. And then it goes into the system and we begin using the cryptographic uh, mechanism of digitally certifying, then we index, then we use basic OCR technology to field and all that kind of stuff. In, in addition to OCR, there's a number of others. It, it, you know, and, and again, we, we don't do all the fielding ourselves. We can use partners um, and, then, and then the validation. But what this is doing is it is a collection of data and a reporting so that when that certification from the building owner, that they've met the ESG guidelines that they're doing, Yes, we can do that, absolutely. Now, another side uh, project that we've been doing is we are tokenizing uh, uh, microfinance loans in East Africa um, that where people could then facilitate fund a loan off their phone and repay the loan off their phone for a lot of the unbanked in Africa. So we've been working on that for about a year and a half. It's working, it's in beta. People are uh, informing it so that when an ESG investor wants to invest and fund loans, they can see the actual recipients, you know what I mean? And they see live time data on it. And so that's kind of outside our core, but it was part of kind of just the, the good that we wanted to do to support, you know, uh, the broadening of the economy and using these technologies to, to provide greater inclusion to lots of the communities that don't have access to it. So yes, we can do that. And absolutely we are doing it. Um, and, and, and I want to take that and transition directly, Troy, into the next question, which is, is the data publicly available data or collecting it from third party? So, this is not a Rionomy or a CoStar or a Zillow, right? Where you scrape public data and then impute uh, uh, value to a third party or you attribute it to uh, a party that may or may not subscribe to you. What we're doing is we're creating this where building or asset owners themselves are, are using our software to credential their data. Again, think of it just like having Deloitte come in and audit your financials. We are doing this where we're providing credentialing of the performance of the assets that you own. And then you can change, you can share that on an anonymized basis in order to say relative value and comparative performance, or you can do it on a per se basis where they know your name and you give somebody access to see that who's a potential buyer and investor. So none of this is publicly available data. We're just credentialing that data, but then we give a mechanism to share that. And we do that using what's called a zero knowledge proof. And this is something big in cryptography, right? And a zero knowledge proof is when Troy and I walk into to a bar um, and, they, and we want to order a drink and they ask for our ID uh, and we show them our IDs that we're above 21. When we did that, all sorts of data leaked out. They now know our names. They know where we live. They know, you know, our birth dates, all sorts of information. A zero knowledge proof is we would walk into a bar and they would look at Troy's gray hair and my gray beard, and they'd say they're over 21, right? There was no data leakage, but they can confirm we're over 21. What we're doing is creating mechanisms for your data to be credentialed and then share that in a zero knowledge comparative where there, it's called a randomized anonymous interaction with specific data sets that then gets penalized with 30 like buildings and you can see how you're performing against them. And that's called a ZK raised, um, a zero knowledge raised proof. And, um, and so that's, which is kind of an evolution beyond what's called the ZK snark. I'm sorry, that was a long answer. Um, well, but, there, but there's an, an important aspect of, of that, which is part of, part of the reason um, information asymmetries can be difficult to resolve in whatever context is one, the validation question, the trust question. But the other side of that is, is all right, well, if I tell you this little bit, I'm necessarily going to have to tell you a bunch more than you need to know and a bunch more than I want to tell you. And so if I'm faced when it comes to the question of do I disclose more to you with the following choice, Am I under-inclusive or over-inclusive? Often the tendency will be, well, I'm going to be under-inclusive if those are my only two choices, right? The information yes. leak is problem. And so one of the things that um, zero knowledge proof cryptography and the like has allowed for is to sh share information in a focused way to whom you want to share it for the purpose you want to share it and they want it to be shared while not disclosing more, while not having the leakage problem 
that can otherwise thwart the exchange of information. And so that's a huge advancement. That's a huge part of addressing information asymmetries, which is huge to addressing questions around markets and pricing and trust and the ability for two parties where there is a zone to bargain in to in fact be able to bargain. Yeah, and, and this, 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 uh, as you said, it's always the devil and the Holy Spirit are in the details, right? There always are, right? And, and how you share the data and the ability for people to manipulate it and this, uh, this data leakage and how do we facilitate this performance where we don't just give away our rights to a third party database that we trust that they're not going to abuse our data because we've seen how that's played out over the last 15 years. You know what I mean? Because it has been abused again and again and people want to retain their data, but they want to credential it so that when they choose to share it, that happens. And so when we do this, what we're doing is creating mechanisms for people to gain access in a gateway. And so Invenium is a gateway for people to see the access in their systems but where they're not, where that can be closed at any time, but not only that, um, that the information that is uh, credentialing that data is what's on chain or in a local Merkle tree. It is not the data itself, right? It's not on a public chain, et cetera. And the value of this is it creates the audit trail. It makes it observable. And that has real teeth and impact today to big companies. And I'm answering another question here, Troy, that, that, that came in where what is the real value? So let's take a big public company, a banking system, right? Bank of Montreal, Toronto Dominion, um, JP Morgan Chase, uh, uh, um, Lloyd's TSB, somebody who's got a lot of branches that they occupy th uh, that are on their balance sheet. That on their balance sheet, they hold in PP&E. They don't hold it as an asset. They, and the reason is, there's a number of reasons, but they, they can't value those because they've got hundreds and hundreds of locations. So a big corporation like JP Morgan Chase literally has tens of billions of dollars, including the asset that they bought, the headquarters of Bear Stearns, who I used to work for, right? Um, that they got in the, in the acquisition in 08. Uh, I think it was 08, right? It was in February 08. Now, but the, the, um, when they bought that, they're carrying that at acquisition cost plus improvements minus accumulated depreciation, which is, uh, we're talking about a billion dollar asset that they're holding at almost nothing. When we use our software that we can now on a frequent basis do things that were not possible four years ago, deliver a, a fair market value on all of those assets, they can use a derivative, a tracking stock, or a capital markets transaction to move those assets sometimes that have been depreciated all the way down to zero, right? Onto their balance sheet. And literally for a bank that impacts their tier two capital, right? That, that which impacts their capital risk and their value at risk calculations. It has massive impact. For a university that have the fully depreciated assets, you go to, go to any big 10 university, I'm in, sitting here in Michigan, go to any big 10 university and online or their financial statements, they all have billions of dollars of real estate assets that have been depreciated all the way down to zero. Um, and what we're able to do is through our software, unlock value through better data that will impact their net assets, which will impact their credit rating, right? So for, for large borrowers, for fiduciaries who can communicate better, right? A pension plan, they can communicate the value of their real estate asset where they all know singly better to reduce the OPEB obligation of an, of, uh, an investor. This has huge teeth. We get paid a subscription basis, um, you know, on an annualized basis as a percentage of the uh, um, of the aggregate value of what we're valuing um, in, through price discovery, our right, fair market value, and that might be anywhere from you know six to twenty five basis points a year. But the impact on their balance sheet is far in excess of that lowering borrowing costs if we've raised their, their credit rating, um, their ability to borrow off of that dramatically enhanced, um, or a, to, to maintain a share price if they think that their portfolio as a public REIT is gonna be under pressure because there's doubt as to the value of their portfolio in this changing market, and they can give other data sets uh, that, that inform that. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm, I'm answering a number of questions at once, Troy, and I'm just going on and on. I think that's great. Uh, it, it, I think any that's other great. comments on that? Um, I don't. I, I think we may be, if um, I got the timing right, just about uh, wrapped up. I don't know, Pat, if there's any final 
final thought that you want to make sure you have a chance to leave folks with, I think now probably would be a good time as we wrap this up. Yeah, there was a question about how close are we to the distributed ledger actually being used in business and accounting in a real-time basis. And I think the answer to that is um, we facilitate businesses getting ready to move to the distributed ledger when it is accepted. Um, you know, kind of making it, if you'll excuse the analogy, Y2K compliant, right? We've done all the work, all we have to flip a switch and now we're embedding data into the payload of the block, credentialing the data in our systems instead of writing it to a local Merkle tree. That makes, that has enormous value to large public companies um, because they're able to use the local Merkle tree to provide the provenance to make that data fully observable. And when they want third parties to believe that and not just their accountants, suddenly it takes off. I think everybody believes it's inevitable that we're going there. I think the question is how soon is it going to be three years or five years? Is it going to be Corda? Is it going to be Hyperledger? Is it going to be a public chain? Is it going to be a private chain? We shall see, but there's no question three le uh, entry ledger systems, meaning distributed ledgers, uh, are going to be the way of the, of the future. Troy, do you want to comment on that? I would just say, look, I think blockchain, decentralization, technology, you marry all of that up, as well as other technological advances, throw in AI, machine learning. Uh, quantum computing when that's really uh, had some real applications and use cases and I'm sure all kinds of stuff that we don't even know about yet. You marry that up with data uh, of the kinds and types and the scale and scope that we have. Uh, I just think there's all kinds of promise. Yeah. And so I find interesting is, is various efforts and various aspects of that um, and Vinium being one of them, um, which are trying to take advantage to leverage all of that to yield what I think are really potentially significant output, out, outcomes. And it kind of comes back full circle to, to the beginning of the discussion, which is the point I'll end with, which is I think if, if things like this um, uh, prove out and the promise becomes the reality, um, then at scale, then it's not only good for all of the individual participants in the system, but it's good for growth, it's good for opportunity. I think ultimately to your point, it's good for inclusion and there's a lot of big, if you will, kind of macro payoffs in yes. addition to the micro personal payoffs. Now, will that take a little time? Sure. But a lot of good things take a little time. But I think there's a, a whole lot of opportunity and promise uh, there, uh, generally um, speaking, in lots of ways. And this is a great illustration. So it's been fun for me, Pat, to have the chance to have this uh, chat with you. And um, I'm sure if there are questions that you weren't able to get to, I don't want to speak for you, but I'm sure you'd be willing to find some other way to interact with those folks and uh, address whatever it is they wanted to hear your thoughts on. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll work with the, the folks at, at uh, Reuters to, to respond to those if there's additional questions. Uh, as always, Troy, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks so much. And um, thanks to all the folks at Reuters who hosted us. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone.